Over the next several minutes, I will explain why everyone should have a precious metals portfolio. The British economic historian Neil Ferguson observes that we live in a world, in his words, on the edge of chaos. To give you an example of what he means, a winter snowbank up on a mountain is a thing of beauty until one snowflake too many turns it into a catastrophic avalanche. The author Nassim Taleb also alerts us to earth-shaking events. He calls them black swans, meaning that they are rare, but importantly, they do happen. We can hope a black swan doesn't appear in our lifetime, or I should say another black swan does not appear, because the September 2008 banking and financial collapse was clearly one of those rare events. So we ignore this reality at our peril. The prudent response is to accept the fact that potential chaos is a reality and that black swan events do indeed happen. So we need to take steps as best we think possible to prepare for the unexpected knowing that each of us and our families will be protected come what may. One of these events is the title of my book, The Coming Collapse of the U.S. Dollar. I co-authored with John Rubino and published in 2004. Even though there have been dozens of currency collapses since the end of the Second World War with limited repercussions, like the recent one in Zimbabwe, the collapse of the U.S. dollar would clearly be a black swan. As the world's reserve currency, the fallout would be global. But here we are eight years after the book was published, and yet the U.S. dollar is still circulating in the States as well as in global commerce. So were John and I wrong in our book's conclusion? I don't think so. If a car is heading toward a cliff, sooner or later it will go over the precipice. The only thing that will prevent a catastrophe is to change direction. But unfortunately, the U.S. dollar is still headed for the cliff, as I'll explain in a minute. But first, you need to make sure that you're not riding in that car, and here's where I turn to gold. You'll see from this table, the dollar is indeed collapsing against gold. So too are the British pound, euro, and even the Swiss franc. And the Canadian dollar too has collapsed against gold, but not quite as much. Gold has risen 13.7% per year on average against the Canadian dollar, compared to 17.7% in terms of the US dollar. This difference, of course, reflects the Canadian dollar's relative strength, which was not strong enough, though, to keep it from falling against gold. Now, after looking at this table, you might be thinking that you missed an opportunity to increase your wealth. Don't worry, you haven't missed the move. As well as gold has done the past 11 years, it is still undervalued, as this chart of the Gold Money Index illustrates. The formula for this index is simple. Just divide total central bank foreign exchange reserves by the gold they hold in their vault. There are four key points on this chart. In the 1960s, the dollar was, in the popular saying back then, as good as gold because gold was overvalued. Its actual price was above its fair value, as arrow number one shows. Then after the U.S. dollar's formal link to gold was broken in 1971, arrows two and three show that gold became overvalued for a time, marking in each case a temporary peak in price namely $200 in 1974 and $850 in 1980. But look at the relationship between fair value and the actual price now at arrow number four. Gold is still well below its fair value of about $11,000 per ounce. Now I can understand that an $11,000 price may sound shocking. So let's consider whether this price is realistic, or in other words, whether the gold money index notwithstanding its very reliable track record from the 1960s and 1970s is still valid. The gap between gold's fair value and its actual price at arrow number four reflects two things. First, a lot of goods globally have been paid for with credit, not with tangible assets. The huge global imbalances from trade flows as well as sovereign debt loads are evidence of the unprecedented use of credit. But why has this historical anomaly become so huge and persisted for so long? It's a complex question, but the simple answer is that we are in a fiat currency bubble. From time to time, new conventional wisdoms defying logic and historical precedent become fashionable and fixed in the mindset of the population, holding sway until the bubble brought about by the fallacious thinking pops. We saw this phenomenon in the internet bubble when it was said that profits don't matter, only market share does. We saw it again in the real estate bubble when it was said that home prices only go up. And we are seeing it now when people say the dollar is money. It is not money in the true meaning of that word. The dollar and indeed 
All national currencies of the world are only a money substitute. They are credit, or it may be clearer if we say that they are based on a promise. They are not tangible assets. They are not like gold, which is money as the next chart explains. This chart of crude oil prices shows that something is happening to currencies that is more profound than first meets the eye. This is a base 100 analysis from 1950 to the present. While crude oil is becoming more and more expensive in terms of national currencies, its price when measured in terms of gold is essentially the same. In other words, an ounce of gold today purchases basically the same amount of crude oil as it did 60 years ago. This chart shows how gold preserves purchasing power, which is what money is supposed to do. So how do we reconcile this chart with the price of crude oil and gold essentially unchanged with a table that shows gold rising at double digits? Well, the answer is that the price of gold is not rising, but rather the purchasing power of national currencies is being eroded away by inflation and debasement at double digit rates. You are losing purchasing power, which is that portion of your wealth held as money at double digit annual rates, particularly in this environment of zero or near zero interest rates. Currencies are being mismanaged by central banks, which brings me to my last chart. This one shows why the US dollar, and indeed many currencies around the world, are heading toward that cliff I spoke about earlier. This chart illustrates the US government's deficit and growing debt load. U.S. government expenditures are the red line, and you can clearly see the huge gap in relation to its revenue, which is the blue line. The green bars in the background are total U.S. government debt. This chart illustrates a structural problem, and it is one that arises time and again throughout monetary history. When currency is backed by promises instead of gold or silver, governments always spend too much money. The result is that their deficits and debts grow. At that moment, the government forces the central bank to give them the currency the government wants to spend. This is happening today. You will recognize it as a process called quantitative easing, which again brings us full circle back to gold. We all know that governments cannot print gold or create it out of thin air. More importantly, gold's value does not arise from government edict, but rather from the countless people around the globe who appreciate its 5,000 year history as money. And I suspect they will increasingly value gold as today's interrelated insolvent bank and sovereign debt crises worsen. Physical gold is a tangible asset, so it does not have counterparty risk. In contrast, there are many forms of paper gold, but with these, you do not own gold. You only own exposure to the gold price, and this exposure comes with counterparty risk. With all the financial and monetary uncertainty in the world today, I recommend owning physical gold or its close cousin physical silver. I will conclude by simply emphasizing that if you want the safety and security of professional storage, we at Gold Money can help make that storage convenient for you.